Hey, welcome to Creative Block. We're your hosts, Gene. And B. We interview people in the animation industry about their life, work, and hobbies while we doodle jam. Uh, we asked people on Twitter if they had specific topics they wanted us to discuss, as well as some drawing prompts. And today with us, we have Marie! Yay! <laughs> Tell us who you are and what you do. All right. Well, hi. I'm Marie Lum, as you all know, at least Jean and V. Also known as Puka. Also known as Puka, Puka Noodles, whatever you want to call me on Twitter is fine. Um, let's see, what do I do? I am a storyboard artist, as you know, a lot of people are. And uh, I don't know, what else do I do? I love to eat. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I actually met you for the first time, Marie, on uh, Craig of the Creek. Yeah, that's right. We probably followed each other on Twitter or something or like yeah. social media. Yeah, social media for a little while. I had I had your book actually. I bought it from um, what's it called, Gallery Nucleus. Oh my god, which one? Uh, like a long, long time ago, and I was like, oh, this is so cute. It was the one that looks like a composition book. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and then we met on Craig of the Creek. Because you did supervising, and I was a revisionist. Oh my god! <laughs> oh my gosh! Was that was that your first job? That was my first job. Yeah, it was my first job. Oh my gosh! Uh, yeah, and I was on that show for like two years or so. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was fun. I was on Craig of the Creek. Yeah. So when you were a little kid, did you always know you wanted to draw or go into animation? Kind of how was for you the um, moment when you realized it and kind of what led up to that moment? So long story. I'll try to make it short. <laughs> Basically, uh, I started drawing when I was like, what, like two? Well, like my mom said I was drawing ever since I could hold a pencil. So that's maybe like, maybe like two. <laughs> yeah, that they're like super classic. Like, oh, you've been drawing since you were in diapers. That old chestnut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, everyone says that. And they're like, oh, you've been drawing since you were in diapers. Um, and my mom still has every single drawing I've ever done since I was a kid that she could like keep and oh, archive. The so they're in like yeah. these giant boxes, like these tubs in my garage. And so I'll go over them every so often. I'll be like, mom, oh, I did the same. what was I drawing here? And she's like, oh, you were drawing like a soul. It was always really vague. And my mom's also a graphic designer in like what, like the 80s and the 70s. Mm, she would okay. draw, you know how um, grocery stores on their ads, they would have hand-drawn produce and all the hand-drawn ads yeah, and stuff. Yeah. So my mom did that kind of stuff. Oh, that's, oh, that's cool. great. Okay. That's... It runs in the family a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Actually, my whole family is full of artists. It's really weird that like huh. apparently that doesn't happen often, but on both sides of my family, it's very artsy. So they were all hoping that I would become like some kind of scientist or engineer. <laughs> they were like, break the cycle. <laughs> they were really hoping that I would break the cycle, but then I started drawing and they were like, ah. Oh, Darn it! <laughs> <laughs> well, you're doing well for yourself, so I know it's fine. Um, my brother is an engineer, so you know he's the oh, um, he's the <laughs> making the family proud. But anyway, um... <laughs> he absorbed that. <laughs> He absorbed it. It's fine. But so I, I was drawing since I was a kid, whatever. I always just liked to draw because it was the one thing that I was better than anyone at in yeah. school. And I was like, yeah, this is me. This is my thing. <laughs> <laughs> and if anyone was like, I can draw too, I would secretly be like, but that's my thing. <laughs> Back up. That's my thing. Like, excuse me, but I'm the drawer here. Um, There's only room for one of us. It's, that's so, like, <laughs> child petty, you know? Like. Oh, but everyone has a title when you're that young. Yeah, right? like, if, like, I remember my friend was the person who liked pirates, and then there was a new kid who liked pirates, and he was so offended. He was like, um, I'm the pirates kid. You can't be yeah. the pirates kid. <laughs> you just, you don't want to be the smelly kid. That's the only thing yeah. you want to be. Um, so yeah, and then I think at some point when I was a kid, we got like the Cinderella DVD diamond edition or whatever the heck, you know, how they release DVDs, however, I don't even know. But they had like the special features that was like, you know, behind the scenes of Cinderella, super old footage, like, you know, mega. There was pictures of people, you know, pitching storyboards. And I was like, that's cool. I want to do that. 
And so... Oh my gosh. How old were you when you saw that? Do you remember, like, approximately? Like, probably, like, seven or eight. <laughs> That's great. Like, at seven, you were like... I found my calling. Yeah, I was like, that's cool. Like, you get to stand up in front of people and show your drawings and make people laugh. Like, what else could you want in life? So that's how it went. And then, yeah, like third grade, I made a whole life plan for myself because I guess I'm a type A person. And I was like, okay, I go through high school. I graduate. I go to art school. I graduate. I get a job doing animation. Yeah. And then I live my life. And I'm happy. And so far, I've oh, followed that. That's good. <laughs> I was waiting for a bad ending. Yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, gosh. And I went to, what's it called? Otis College of Art and Design for college. Mm -hmm. um, in high school, also, I had an art teacher that taught, like, animation. He had, like, a whole four-year animation program in high school. And I was like, what? And so I learned how to, like, use Flash and, you know... Basics of animation. Yeah, graduated, went to art school. That was all right. Um, <laughs> graduated. <laughs> We're going to hear that a lot. Was that in California as well? What state was this? Oh, uh, that was just in Los Angeles, actually. Um, if you live in LA, if you're driving down the 405, you might see this sign that says, Otis, College of Art and Design, exit on your right. That's the school that I went to. I like that you said if you drive down the 405, that was the most <laughs> LA thing I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. The 405. That's all we do in LA. We just talk about streets. Yeah, we just drive places. We're always in traffic going somewhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> not not as much now, I guess. That's good. The one bonus of quarantine. Yeah. Not as much now. You said the school was all right, but like, is there anything that you like particular that you learned in school or like people that you met or just things that stood out to mm. you? College. Mm, for sure. Uh, definitely the people that I met. I think that's like an across the board thing for art school. You know, you go and it's like the curriculum is like, eh, but it's the people that you meet, like the <laughs> awesome professors and like great teachers, classmates. You know, I met my my roommate and best friend, um, Amanda Huynh. We mm -hmm. went to Otis together. We were like in the same foundation class, which is the first year of Otis, you go through these foundational classes like life drawing, perspective drawing, painting, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So you're put in these classes and you stay in this kind of like homeroom class that moves through each class. So you're with the same classmates the entire foundation year. So your first year of college. And so we were in the same class. And so I met all of like my closest friends through there. Yeah, I think that's the most I got out of it was actually foundation year was the most like super helpful thing I'd ever taken because we did so much life drawing and perspective drawing and, you know, just like drawing basics, yeah. things that you really need to keep going forward. And then friends. So, you know, I love yeah. friends. <laughs> yeah, the, the, I feel like that, I mean, that's definitely the case with me is where like, I didn't learn shit while I was in school. <laughs> yeah. I had to unlearn things I learned, but oh. I, but I did make like really good friends and I feel like that are, I'm still friends with. And I feel like that meant more like in mm -hmm. the long run. Cause like, whatever, school is school. It just, you make the best of the, the most of it, I guess. Yeah, exactly. School is school. You learn things here and there. It, it's all like, you know, what applies to you, you take and what doesn't, you just gotta like block out, you know, because everyone's different and learns in a different yeah. way. And yeah. sometimes teachers give you things that's like, you must know this. And it's like, well, not really. Uh <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's so true. My college insisted on teaching 3D over anything else because that was the only feasible chance of getting a job in the suburb where I went to school. And so, like, they were really hammering in 3DS Max of all things because, you know, the oh, industry man. standard 3DS Max. <laughs> <laughs> but I kind of just like I, I I played along like the first class and then I like gave up and just started doing 2D for everything mm. and I was like hey I'm just gonna do this like sorry like I'm just gonna stick with what I already know and they didn't really care because I'm the one paying anyway yeah I feel like that's kind of great when you're in a college that is like how long um did you spend in uh, college? I was four maybe? years so I got my bachelor of fine art degree <laughs> <laughs> uh, no but that's great like you you, you got the degree 
Like, uh, I feel like in, like, the smaller schools, there's probably, like, a little bit more of, like, a lenient attitude. Like, in Gobelin, where I went, if you missed too many classes or if you didn't get grades good enough, you could get kicked out, which is, like, oh, but, ah, Oof, there was on. There was a huge <laughs> problem with that because, oh, my gosh. I had Otis, it was, like, if you missed two classes, in, like, if you missed, yeah, two days of class, then you could like totally get kicked out which is two days oh. two days you get a like an academic warning where you have to go sit with the chair oh my god the dean and explain to them <gasps> why you missed those classes and i had to always go and fight for it because i was like hey i have like these genetic disorders and disabilities where i can't get out of bed some days like i i literally can't like i don't know what you want me to do and they were like well Okay, you're you are our only animation student here, oh so we'll give you <laughs> we'll give you a pass. But um, that was always a huge problem at my school because it was oh. just like third one, you're kicked out. You don't even get like a redemption. Man, that's crazy to me. I know, and then you get an F, and then you can't graduate. So, well, it's like I don't get the like you're paying to be there. Like I understand that they want you to respect their time too, but it's like, well, I'm paying to be here. Like this isn't public school. Exactly. If I don't want to show up for the classes and fail, then that's like that's my choice. Yeah, I mean, like uh, it just is just wild how they didn't have any leniency for a lot of people. I think I got really lucky because I was one of the only animation students there. Everyone else was motion graphic graphics and they didn't actually have an animation portion i kind of had to pave the way for that because they were like well we have one animation class you can take maybe like four times a semester if you want <laughs> so i took the same animation class like four or five times and i ta'd for it like three times it was awful yeah, yeah they they just like had zero leniency towards absentees even if you were sick they were like that's your problem. And I'm like, dude, we're paying you like freaking four million dollars, a billion yeah. dollars a year, like or a semester. You could just like let us handle this how we want, you know? <laughs> the the stress of school never goes away. Like like high school is hard enough, but then like people talk about college like it's so liberating and it's like, yeah, not really. It's still punishment. Like Yeah. You're still paying to do work, which is awful. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, uh, I feel like you... that's just like the craziest like thing that changes between college and starting to work is like you pretty much do the same thing, but you're not spending money anymore. You're actually making money. Right. It's like really weird. And you don't have like exams. You don't have to write twelve paid papers. Yeah. I mean, unless you like really want to or or something, but like, you know, you don't have to write a twelve page paper on like art history or something um when you're working as a storyboard artist so yeah yeah well yeah so i met you when you were like 20 or something i think you were 20 yeah 2019 i was like just just starting just a baby just a baby yeah that was oh my gosh how old am I now? I don't, I don't 25? Know. <laughs> that was a while ago, yeah. It was. Well, I was your age. Yeah. That's actually, no, I was young. I was 24 or something like that. Mm -mm -mm. But um, yeah, that was crazy. But I, I, it's been interesting watching you grow up and mature yeah. as an artist yeah. because I feel like you, you've really like figured out what you want to do. And uh, even now, like, uh, I don't know if you're working currently. You can, you can definitely talk about that. But I was going to say, like, I admire how you found a hustle. Like you've been making those hats <laughs> with the names on them. And it's like, Hey man, like I don't know, like you're you're good at having a grind. Like you know how to take advantage of your like of the amount of people that you have watching you and stuff. Well, like it's thanks. great. Yeah, I'm I'm currently working um, at Warner Brothers right now. Actually, oh, okay. it's like my last week because I'm moving on to Disney next week. Oh, cool. Yeah, and so um, I've been working at Warner Brothers for the past six months, I guess. Ever since I got I got back from New Zealand because I went to New Zealand for four months and you lost, have to talk about that. By I way. lost myself there, which was awesome, and then um, came back, had about like a month to like get back into it and kind of 
wrap my head around this quarantine situation, which was just yeah absolutely wild to come back to after I was like pretty much free to do whatever I wanted in like the mm-hmm. New Zealand wilderness, and then I'm back inside forever. Yeah, um, and then I started at <laughs> Warner Brothers, and then now I'm going on Disney, and then uh, I have my online store, which is great. Yeah, I don't I don't yeah. really know why I started that. I just was like. Oh, I have all this like convention stock and I don't, there's no conventions this year, obviously. And so I just was like, oh, I'll throw it up on my online store. And then now I'm like super into it and I'm like getting into jewelry making and it's fun. So. Well, people seem to like it. Yeah. Yeah. How was the transition for you between school and finding your first gig? Kind of tell us about that moment, how long it took for you to get a first gig. Mm -hmm. Like if. Uh, how many tests you took, if you took many, or like, how did you connect or network with people, all of that. I'm really interested in that. Oh, man. Okay. So I think I started, you know, testing around, let me think, maybe a couple months, like three or four months before I graduated, which was, let me think, like, May of 2017. And so like around like the winter fall time, I started like emailing and asking around and I had a lot of people helping me actually, which was really nice. So I had like a lot of friends being like, oh, here's like a recruiter that you can email. And yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, I I really didn't know what I was doing, honestly. (laughs) I was just, like, following what people were telling me to do, like, email. And then I had, like, cover letters, resume, of course. Uh, And we had a class in in college that helped us with resume and cover letter. So that was a little helpful. So I set that out. And I got a bunch of tests, Mm -hmm. like, maybe six or seven tests all at once. And I was like, oh. Uh, okay, uh, I guess I guess I'll do all of them in one go. That was really hard, I think. <laughs> I, th- I think maybe I should have like spaced it out a little bit because I, I sent all of these emails to a bunch of places like all at once <laughs> and then I got all these tests back at the same time and, and I was like, oh, uh, okay. And I didn't realize at the time that right. I could be like, hey, can I do right. this like, uh, like next week maybe like can my time start for this next week and that would have been fine but I just thought like oh I have to do it all now so don't make that mistake that was bad because I pretty much killed myself and on top of that I had like my senior work for um, college to finish and that was like super stressful um, but I took a bunch of tests you were taking the tests at the same time as you were finishing school yeah wow. yeah yeah pretty much and uh, that was a mistake <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask like what kind of studios and like how did you make the friends that were kind of recommending you all the different gigs or like where to apply? Was it internet or with people that you met at like convention? Yeah, it was like kind of a mix of both, but mostly the internet. Like at the time that I had just started getting more into Twitter, like I had Twitter for a couple of years beforehand, but it was mostly like... Like a Terraria <laughs> fan account. What? <laughs> yeah. What a specific thing. <laughs> oh, it, this is this is a whole lore that I could go on into. But long story short, I was really into the Terraria PvP community, wow. and I was on the number one team for Terraria wow. PvP, and so that is what my account was for. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But um, anyway, I love that. <laughs> That's my deep Twitter lore. Anyway, anyway, I, I like I, I started college and I switched it up and I was like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll start like posting art on here. Like, why not? I I thought like, oh, it might be kind of an archive because like DeviantArt is like dead ish, and Tumblr was yeah. getting to a point where I couldn't like it was really hard for me to post and like be focused on it. So I was like, oh, I'll just use Twitter as like an archive kind of and then I met a bunch of artists through there and it kind of grew out that way organically because then everyone was like following everyone we were all talking and we we're like oh hi like I make art too and this was back in like like 2014 I think and so uh after college uh some of those friends that I had made were like recommending me that was very nice, and that helped a lot because I was totally clueless, but um, yeah, that helped a lot. Yeah, it's always just connections. 
Yeah, I feel like knowing people is like a huge part of like getting a first gig for sure. I feel like for me, it was Tumblr. Like I kind of networked through Tumblr, just kind of liking other people's art and being like, you're awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's hard to like find that balance too, because it's like I've gone to parties where somebody finds out that I'm in a job and then starts talking to me clearly with the intent of trying to like pitch their portfolio to me and it's like man i was at a party just vibing and now like i have to yeah right. it's like i, I get it because i've been there and i have definitely done that like i went at comic con and shit like mm -hmm. i would find out somebody worked at cartoon network and i'd be like oh oh could you give my like portfolio to somebody but it's like <laughs> you gotta just be you gotta just be chill man you gotta just like it's a long it's a long game like you gotta just be a cool guy that people want to work with yeah yeah Definitely, there's like always a time and place and also just like it happens organically, I think. Like if you... Yeah, it happens organically. Oh my gosh, yeah. Like just meeting people and all of a sudden they know and they hound you for that. Like you said, Gene, it's like yeah. a super like, oh, I know yeah. why this person's talking to me now. And then it just feels like, like, do I not matter as a person? Like, am I yeah. not a person to you? Am I just a rung in the ladder? <laughs> that you get, I get all sad. But, uh, yeah. yeah. That's so true, though. That's a bummer. I just politely <laughs> try to, like, be like, yep, sure, okay. I don't know. It's, it's hard. I'm always like, oh, like, give me your card, and I'll keep you in mind. And then later, if I, if they're actually, like, really, really good, I'm like, oh, oh, okay. But, um... <laughs> but usually it's just like I feel bad. It's like feels bad man after because then I just feel like I'm nothing more than my job to you. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think something that like I sure didn't realize when I was on that end of it and still now I, I wish I could impart on people. It's like we don't really have any power over any of that. Like unless you're basically a showrunner or maybe a director, mm -hmm. like you don't have any hiring and you don't have any say in who gets hired. And, like, most of the time, it's just, like, there's nothing you can do. And so people will, like, expect that I'll be able to do something. It's like, dude, I, I can't even find a job half the time. So yeah. it's like, I don't know what to do. Like, Yeah, and even, like, recommendations and stuff, like, that only goes so far. Because, yeah. like, you might have a recommendation, but, you know, obviously the showrunners have people in mind, too. And the directors have recommendations. And it's like, you yeah. know. Everyone is recommended. Everyone people. has a recommendation. So it's just, you know. Like, you got to keep that in mind. Yeah. I tried to push you through, I remember, to the Nickelodeon internship. Yeah, I yeah, I was about to say that. That was really yeah. nice. I, I remember <laughs> doing that, oh my gosh, looking for an internship. That was like a whole nother. Yeah, internships suck. That was, that was hard. Yeah, I, I got my internship, like, I feel like just like out of pure luck. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how it always feels. Yeah, I was like, oh my goodness. Yeah, just testing around, tested up until the end of my school time. And I remember coming up onto graduation, I was super stressed as everyone is during graduation. Like, oh my gosh, like, am I gonna get a job? Uh, ah, you know, that, that stress. Yeah. And then um, I got contacted by Craig of the Creek and they were like, hey, like, we like your work. You wanna test for us? And I was like, I've taken so many tests, like, my body is broken, <laughs> can I even do one more? And I was like, fine, I'll do it, I guess. I have a little bit of energy left. So I did it, and that was the one where I did it, and I submitted it, and I was really like, I don't think, like, there's no way they're gonna contact me back. This one, I had, like, 2% brain power left for this. And then they ended up, they did contact me back. I was so surprised. Nice. I was at, I was at WonderCon. I was tabling and I remember getting the email and I screamed oh. <laughs> like in the middle of Artist Alley and everyone was like, whoa, what's going on? And I'm just like, oh my God, I just got hired. And then everyone was like, yay. And they were clapping for me <laughs> and that was really great. But yeah, that, that was just like a ride. And I just remember being so haggard by the by the end of that and i was like yes it's okay mom and dad you don't have to worry about me no more i'm okay yeah <laughs> there is kind of a nice uh sense of relief once you finally get that job i remember when i when i got my first job i called my parents and i told them and i was like are you proud of me and they're like of course we're proud of you like we were always proud of you, you didn't need to do this to like 
for us to be proud of you. And I was like, oh. That's so sweet. And I, but then then I realized I have to make myself proud, and that was even scarier, and I'm still trying to figure that out. So. That is that is the hard part, yeah. It's always like, am I good enough for this job? Like, yeah. am I really, like, doing a good job? Like, who knows kind of thing. And, yeah, that's, that's like, a huge hurdle to get over that I have not even. I don't, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a, that's a hard one. Uh, were your were your parents always like super supportive of your art journey and stuff like that though? Mine, yeah, always. Well, I also come from an artsy family, mm-hmm. like very very liberal. I mean, it's more musical, musical, but it, like my grandma was an artist. My dad, um, or my my grandpa was a musician. My mom was a musician. My dad like worked in music, so it's just like. It was never, it was never a, a hurdle for me. So it's like, yeah, I, I, I'm sure it's hard when you're growing up in a family where it, like that, it's like you're not, you're almost discouraged from pursuing it. Like that probably sucks. Yeah. For, for a while, my family was definitely like, you're going to start, you know, like starving artists. And they would yeah. always make jokes like that. And now it's, they're like, oh, okay, you're fine. But <laughs> Oh, that's what's funny. Like, especially now, like, animation is the only industry still going <laughs> during the quarantine. Yeah, pretty like, much. Like, look at me now, mom. I know. I, <laughs> yeah. Like, hey. What's your paycheck, mom? <laughs> oh, God. Oh, my God. <laughs> if I ever said that to my mom, I would get slapped. But, <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's my journey. Very exciting. And now I'm here, you know. Uh, so, like, what is some of the stuff that really kind of pushed you along when you were a kid? Like, what's your favorite stuff? When you think about what shaped you as an artist, what, what are some of the things that immediately come to mind? Oh, my gosh. I have some really weird choices. Go. but No, I want to hear the weird shit more than All anything. right. So, okay. So, one. I love Bionicles. Okay. This is great. <laughs> Let's go. I want to hear this. So... Okay, I just, I have to I like Bionicle too. Okay, I have to stop drawing my really bad bowl of ramen over here to talk to talk talking great. about Bionicles. So Bionicles, <laughs> me and my brother, from the very first comic book, we were like, "Whoa, it's I so have those cool!" Comics. Yeah. yeah, my brother, he he's the one who preserved all of them, but he has the very first one to the very last one. I think I still I have a good chunk of them. Yeah, they're so good, um, and yeah, it's really just well like. There's something, they're so cool. I mean, I don't know how else to describe them besides they're so, like, freaking cool. And my brother and I, we had all of the chapter books, all of the sticker books. Like, we played all of the PC games, all the online PC games, you know. Of course, we had all the movies. Like, that's, you know, of course. Obviously. <laughs> Obviously. Um, and uh, my mom and my brother, uh, my mom's a master builder or whatever at Legoland. And so we always grew up with Legos. Wait, really? Wait, hold on, Go back. What's a master builder for real? I thought that was just only in the movie. No, no, no. It's a real thing. But um, you know, like you know, like those really complicated Lego thingies that they build. And my mom would, you know, she would. I think the first master builder contest was. Oh my gosh, I don't remember. 2006, 2007 that she entered? But they basically put you in front of a big tub of Legos and they give you a theme and they're like, all right, go for it. Like, all you master builders, like, go for it. And so she built this, like, mermaid pirate with a giant, like, treasure chest and she got to, like, the finals, but she didn't win the finals. Someone else did. But, but, like, you know, so my mom does that kind of stuff now. That's crazy. That's such a cool, like, tidbit. (laughs) So, so she, so she does that, whatever. Um, so me and my brother, we would go to Di- Legoland, I'm also Disneyland, uh, yeah. Legoland, like e- once a month. It was like a once a month thing. We would go and, um, I definitely got sick of it <laughs> by like my high school years. I mean, that place I could tell, I could give you, draw you a map, um, like right now if I wanted to, I don't want to though, but <laughs> Right. Uh, gosh. Um, so when Bionicles came out, because we were playing with Legos from like the very beginning, but when Bionicles came out, we were like, whoa, what is this? They have gears. Yeah. They, they have uh, attachable limbs and like masks and like you could, they're like, they fight. Like that's so freaking cool. And I really got sucked into the lore of it. My brother just liked it because they like, you know, fought and stuff. And he he's really good with Legos. Like he made his own like bionicles growing up but uh, so bionicles big influence <laughs> wow okay 
Yeah, I like I uh, I had um five of the six original ones. Every all but the water one. I just didn't like the look of it as much. Mm-mm-mm. Which is also the only female one, which is odd. But it, it's odd that they even are gendered. But only the 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 water ones are female, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> bizarre. It's like such a bizarre. Like they they could have just been genderless, and nobody would have cared. I and, know, like, but you they know, had to do it. they're like the water the water ones, but like. Yeah. You know, Vionicle is just a trip. <laughs> There's like one uh, central writer too, right? I'm sure you probably know the name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't quite remember the name, oh, okay. but yeah, he also did like like all the comics and um, oh my gosh. And there was like the whole like Vionicle like fiasco about like all the names and stuff because it took from like, yeah. like indigenous uh, Polynesian names and stuff. Yeah, and they're they like, ah. <laughs> So They're appropriating a little bit. That was that was a lot. Um, but yeah, that that I can't believe like how long the comic books ran. But it was just so like chock full of like lore, and the characters were so weird that I just loved it. And there was always fighting, you know, always action yeah. and stuff, <laughs> and I love that. And so I would always look towards that as like whoa like the cool robots thingies are fighting and yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you've never seen the comics whoever's listening listening like check them out like the art is awesome they're seriously so amazing I, uh, i've actually never seen or heard anything bionicle so i'm just like oh, oh really me more oh my <laughs> yeah. gosh and like it the way it starts out is great with like the ice one like appearing in that capsule and he's like trying to like assemble and oh, it's, it was neat it's so good yeah on the beach and then yeah. it's like fig- and then you have all the matoran and yeah. it's just great i think it's great <laughs> I'm sure you played the online game. Oh my gosh. Did I ever? <laughs> Did I ever? I have a friend who downloaded the like Swift file just to like be able to play at any time. Yeah. Dude, that and like the art direction for that game, I played it recently. It still holds up. Like it's yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Good. And yeah. I'm just like they had a great team on this, however they made it. And it was, yeah, it was you talk to all the characters and there's so much information about the world when you talk to them. And it's like so intriguing. And there's these mysterious Toa Mata, like in the mist and you don't know what the heck is happening. And it's great. Yeah, it's freaking yeah. great. <laughs> uh, so other than Bionicle, what else? <laughs> okay. Um, I really mm-hmm. liked uh, Ranma one half, of course. Yeah, I got to draw yoga here. Yeah, yeah. I see that as one of the drawing prompts. Also, Ryoga is like my favorite. I think he's so silly. But uh, love Ranma. Uh, the the manga was one of the first. Uh, after I started off with Tokyo Mew Mew. And then I discovered Ranma. And I was just like blown away with how it's... I mean, she's such a wonderful storyteller and visual yeah. storyteller. Like the way the panels are laid out are just, it's genius and it flows so well. And I also remember going to like Hollywood video and seeing, and like just looking for any kind of anime <laughs> that I could check out. And it was like, Ranma, but like maybe the sixth VHS instead of the first. So it's like, well, you take what you can get. Yeah. And I grabbed that, and of course, it had like nudity in it, and my mom like freaked out. But <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I love, I just love Ranma. Um, it's just, I love the art style, of course. Yeah. I've been watching the uh, anime for the first time just because it's good, like, kind of um, background. Well, the dub is actually really, it's got that like corny, like, 90s dub. I love it <laughs> yeah it's great and so like i've just been like tearing through it and it's like you were saying you got um you know like a random vhs but like the plot isn't that important you can yeah. kind of figure out what's happening there's like recaps but yeah like i haven't read the manga and you're actually you're making me want to read the manga because it's uh, it's beautiful yeah it just yeah the way uh she lays out the pages and all the action scenes are so so easy to follow like it's just like another level of just visual storytelling and the flow of it is wonderful. I just am always blown away when I go back to read it. I really love also every old, older manga, like the 90s yeah. manga, mm-hmm. yeah. like late 80s, 90s manga, because they're, I think, the smartest in terms of like uh, how they're going to pick their panels, the pacing, 
and they just only do what's important for the story. So, so you might get a lot of panels with white backgrounds, but it doesn't matter because the story is told so well. Yeah. And Ranma is one of those kind of like uh, Dragon Ball. Like they both kind of use that technique a lot. And it's really, it's, it's, it's actually really fun to read because you only have what's important to look at, which is, I think it's smart and also nice to read. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like it's, you know that as you're reading, like the story is progressing well, and there's a lot of information being told to you, but in a really smart way, like they don't just go, you know, it's not like 10 pages of like scientific graphs or anything. No. But it, and it's also just really fun. Like, it's also goofy. There's a lot of really goofy things and lots of humor, and I love it. So, yeah, it does a really good job. It's like it's such a basic concept. Like, the log line is just like a martial arts kid who turns into girl when splash. Like, that's it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and man, does she milk a lot of plot out of that. Yeah. But it's like, it's funny watching it. The relationships get so complicated. It's like, this character likes Ranma as a boy. This character likes Ranma as a girl. Yeah. This character needs to get married to this character. But this character needs to battle them before they can become the, the greatest warrior. In their life. And it's like, it becomes this like web of, of weird relationships and like all the martial, the silly martial arts they come up with are really funny. Like Yeah, the silly martial arts are the best. It's so ridiculous. It's, it's just so good. And I also... Um, you know, grew up on Hong Kong cinema because my my dad's from Hong Kong and he loves, you know, kung fu movies, of course. And so I would just watch them with him. It channels, it like parallels that kind of thing. Like a lot of Hong Kong cinema has some just really ridiculous um, martial arts that are just like, you know, no human can do this, obviously. Or it's just something really, really out of this world. But it it works really well. And the, you know, the characters in the plot take it seriously. So you also take it seriously. And it's, it's, it's kind of the same thing in Ranma. So that's another reason why I really love it. It's just, it's good. That's kind of an interesting rule of thumb that it's like, as long as the characters take it seriously, you can do whatever crazy thing you want. That's One Piece does that a lot. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's like crazy shit happens, but the characters are like, oh no, this is really serious. And you're like, I guess this is really serious. (laughs) Oh gosh. Uh, I tried starting One Piece and I'm just intimidated by the the amount of content it is. It's a lot. I'm actually just now catching up after a year of uh, reading it. So, but it's good. I, re- I highly recommend it. It's worth it. It's just it is a lot. I feel like One Piece. You don't really have to read the whole thing though, because you get I don't the gist so. of it. You, you you get the gist of it pretty fast. I think it's good yeah. to read. Like I guess like the first ten volumes, because then you're like okay like i see what he's doing i see his style the humor like you meet the main characters and and then if you're really hooked on the story you can keep going but i think uh, you could definitely stop people will fucking burn me for this but i feel like you could probably (laughs) stop uh right around the time skip i mean you you won't want to because it's interesting but i think that arc right before they all kind of go their separate ways is awesome Mm. like that whole fight is great the war of the best but um I don't know. The post time skip is kind of hit or miss for me. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah. What, what else? You got you got to have a top three for sure. Okay. Yeah. So um, as I said, Tokyo Mew Mew. That was my yes. very first anime and manga. That was the first time when I discovered, like, like I realized that this was like a whole world of of animated and animated media and like. And comics that I had no idea existed. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I had no idea. And there's these these cool girls that tur- like turn magical and, and then they fight people. Like, what the heck? Like, why didn't I know about this? And so I I just like deep dove into Tokyo Mew Mew. And I remember reading, you know, you know, the scans illegally online. As you do, <laughs> and I was yeah. in uh was it middle school, maybe? <laughs> And I just, you know, I loved how how it all, just like their costumes look, they're just so beautiful and it's so pretty. But again, like all of like the action scenes, I just loved how powerful these ladies were. Like these, these girls are just like, they put on a magical, like a beautiful costume and they kick ass. Like that's so yeah. cool. And 
I, I just remember sinking into that really hard. And I still have drawings, like my fan art from middle school <laughs> that I drew on my computer. I have it all of Tokyo Mew Mew stuff. And that was another big one. I mean, of course, with Sailor Moon as well. But that was like my cousin's thing. And I didn't want to like, infringe right, yeah. on her obsession. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I have Tokyo Mew Mew. You have Sailor Moon. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, you got to find your... But I like that. I think that like... <laughs> I think that everyone should have should kind of try to find their own thing. Like yeah. you should always have a <laughs> unique flavor. Yeah, but to what also then, like when you when you share the same fandom, Oops. that's so fun. Yeah, I yeah. remember I remember going um, to like the Asian market, and they would have like you know those vending machines for stickers. And she would find Sailor Moon ones, and we would both like freak out like, "Oh, there's Sailor Moon stickers!" And we would spend like five bucks <laughs> on those. Uh, sticker vending machines and it was just so much fun but of course I was still like oh this is your thing like you can have all the stickers if I find Tokyo Mew Mew then it'll be mine but uh <laughs> oh my gosh yeah magical girl anime for sure for sure I can see that yeah I can <laughs> I can definitely see that influence <laughs> yeah and in, uh, in what you do yeah yeah okay that's interesting is there anything else you wanted to talk any other kind of like was there like a specific sort of moment that you saw or read or whatever that really got you inspired to start creating or can you remember that you know like you know what I mean yeah yeah um let me think I guess one of the big moments was when I was introduced to D&D, &D. Um, mm. <laughs> like in high mm. school. I had no idea what the heck D&D &D was. I was like, oh, that's Dungeons and Dragons. Is it for mm -hmm. nerds? Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I got into it because my, my high school had this thing called like Tabletop Gaming Club. And people would, you know, bring their Yu-Gi-Oh cards or Pokemon cards or like play D&D &D or sure, yeah. like whatever, like in the, who was it? Like this anatomy teacher's classroom? He didn't care. Um, he was like, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll supervise this and we would play D&D &D. and you know in high school it was awful but also it was just like a turning point of me just like thinking about storytelling in a bunch of different ways and then that's when I really realized that like oh my gosh like storytelling is so much fun I want to tell my own stories too how like the DM was like oh okay I made this whole story for you guys and you are these characters or you can be whatever characters you want and we'll just have fun I thought that was so cool and um, of course you know playing D&D &D to this day I still am like inspired whenever I play a D&D &D campaign I think after like each session I'm just like wow I want to write something <laughs> so yeah. that was exactly, like exactly um, what I was going to ask you too was like in terms of goals and like plans that you have for things that you want to do like in your career but also artistically as like a side project like what what does that look like for you? Yeah. So let's see. Career goals. Huh. I'm I'm like so happy where I am right now, actually. <laughs> oh, that's really good. That's refreshing to hear. Yeah, like I'm happy where I am. Like I don't think I ever want to be a showrunner because I don't think um like my mind and body could catch up with all of that work. I feel yeah. like it's a lot. Like even if I wanted to have a production that was like, you know, as laid back and chill as you can get, you know, it's still like so much work. And as cool as I think it would be to have my own show, I don't think I'm I'm fit for that. So, and I'm like fine with that, you know. Like I'm I'm okay with like like oh, I don't really want my own show. But yeah. like I'm making my own comic right now. I I have a lot of it, but I haven't posted it because I'm like figuring out legal stuff right now to protect oh. my IP, which is taking a uh, while. I don't know mm -hmm. if that's you should you should worry about that. Like, but I'm just like, oh my goodness, I don't think I could have my own show. But my own comic is fine. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I relate to that a lot too. Just because like when you're drawing a comic like it's really it's like really yours yeah like i can have my characters curse if i want to you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> and also if you ever want to like start out because i see i see that in a lot of like uh long form series where it, it can start with one tone and then slowly kind of devolve into something like different if if you as an artist you grow and change you you have the ability with your comic series to do that mm -hmm. whereas with the show it's a little bit more difficult sometimes because i feel like you kind of have to keep the show always in the same bubble mm. i guess 
Yeah, no, totally. You become chained to the expectation of the network. Yeah, so I'm like, I'm okay with not having my own show. I'm like really happy where I am. I love being a board artist, you know, just like having fun on helping someone else's show come to life and then after work i just work on my own stuff so that makes me really happy hey that's that's a much healthier mentality than than me who is just like (laughs) screaming at the void hoping to get my own show you better you better Uh, yeah Yeah, trying to get a show made is exhausting and like if you don't truly want it with every fiber of your being like do not like it is it is draining. And so it's actually really refreshing and nice to hear you say that, like, you're just not interested in that because I respect that more. Like, I, I think that, like, the I, I see a lot of people who say that they want to show, but they don't realize how hard it is just to get to that point. And then to maintain it is like... It's a lot it, of work. It sucks the life out of you. So yeah. it's like it, to not want it or to be at least like comfortable with not wanting it is yeah. is great. Like you can do it yourself. <laughs> I'm super, super comfortable with not wanting to work that hard. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds that sounds awful but like no, that's like fine. i i know my limitations i know my body's limitations and my mental limitations right. and i would like completely break <laughs> like, i know yeah. i would break so hard so no it takes a uh, lot so i i i also just like having my own stuff being my own yeah well that's kind of where i've ended up too is like i think i would rather just try to make my own stuff and figure out a way to maintain that because that's easier than also dealing with with a pipeline and mm. other expectations. Yeah, pipeline, whole production, yeah. all those business meetings. When I think about that, I'm like, politics. Ah! So, <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's a lot. Like, it would be cool if I could, like, maybe, like, when I'm tired of my ideas, I'll give them to someone else and I'll be like, you can show run for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like you, like you do this for me, and I'll just, I'll just watch and be happy with like whatever you do. I guess unless it's there's a really big issue, then I'll be like. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess you could like have like a consulting deal. Like if ever like one of your like IPs take off, like you're like I just want to consult on it, and then like they have to have like your approval just for like. I mean that's like uh, yeah. like Hilda. You know Hilda was like oh uh, yes a book the comic, series yeah. yeah and the creator just is sort of involved I think it seems pretty faithful. It's such a great I like that show a lot. <laughs> yeah, so you you probably don't want to talk about your comic, but like what I guess like what sort of niche are you hoping to fill like what do you feel like you want to bring into the world creatively that you haven't seen before i'm not even sure about that honestly for me like my characters and my story they're just like things that i like right and then i just kind of do whatever i want with them how i like when i feel like it (laughs) (laughs) but i I don't know, like a lot of representation, hopefully, Mm -hmm. even within like, just like the animation industry and media as a whole, of course. Actually, one of my dreams would be to work on a PBS kids show. Okay. That's like, I love what they do with like representation and like how they deliver messages to kids on PBS kids shows and how it's like, you know, like public access television. Just like, I just love, I just love how they treat kids media. Um, They don't treat kids as like they're stupid, you know, Yeah, (laughs) yeah, which is, which is huge for me because I work with kids a lot and I, I used to work in a nursery for like a decade. Oh, wow. And um, I still do babysitting gigs every so often. Well, not now, obviously, because it's COVID. But um, kids are so smart. Yeah. Uh, When I watch PBS kids shows, I know that the people making them realize that kids are so smart and they'll you know, the way that they give that information to kids and they always talk about really serious things like, you know, like death and, uh, you know, disabilities and neurodiversity, but they put it in, they don't dumb it down for kids, obviously. They explain it in a way that's really helpful and constructive and I love that and... I just want to make media like that. What I what I've seen on PBS Kids. <laughs> oh, that's a really good goal. Yeah, yeah. that's admirable. So sweet. I just think it's great. Uh, I just think it's neat. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I just think it's neat. <laughs> Gosh, that was so accurate. Thank you. Oh, God.
I do think like preschool isn't really covered enough in discussions and stuff because I think there's like like you're saying like there's like a really like a bunch of really cool stuff being done in preschool that just probably isn't like showcased as much probably during like the award seasons or whatever like I don't know if you guys have seen Tumbleweed on Amazon Prime but I thought that shows yeah I haven't I got to uh tour that studio oh, uh, where they make so it so pretty oh really cool, cool. Uh, yeah I saw the puppets and like I, I had a oh. long conversation with the woman who did the costuming for that and like the stress that goes into finding tiny little bits of fabric <laughs> that she obtained years ago and ran out of oh but, like, my gosh the costumes the costumes wear down yeah because they're always bending them and moving them and so she has to keep making the same costumes and like if a roll of fabric runs out, she has to like pursue the maker, the textile, you know, whatever manufacturer Aww. and like get the same. It was like fascinating. It's like, I, I didn't even think, yeah, I didn't even think about that, but that was really interesting. Just the, uh, the sort of the nature. And uh, a friend of mine who brought us on the tour was the guy who, one of the people who would like get rid of all the, the rods and you know, all the stuff that like keeps all the puppets up mm. just so it looks like it's kind of floating in, in the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was his job was like editing everything, the post-production. That's so cool. I love that. <laughs> yeah, it's a really uh, cool show. You touched on it a little bit, but I, I'm wondering if there is sort of like a specific moment or TV show or something that you're kind of trying to like live up to. It's like, I feel like every artist has a thing that they wish that they had made. Oh my you know? gosh, of course. Okay. Um, there are three things <laughs> that I've always wanted to work on, but they don't, you know, it's, you know, production's over, obviously. Um, right. Of course, first one, Avatar, Last Airbender. Oh my okay. God. I love that show. I just think it's What about it? What about it do you like? I love the characters. That's what, you know, draws me into, you know, any kind of story is the characters first and foremost. And the characters are so just like so appealing to me and they have such a life to them. And I love like the arcs that they go through throughout the whole story and just how multifaceted a lot of them like they, they all can be, except for the cabbage guy. I mean, I still love him, but you know. <laughs> Yes. Um, a lot of depth to that. Yeah, and uh, just I think what really draws me into it too is like the magic system is so solid and it makes so much sense. I just thought that's cool. And mm -hmm. uh, that's always something that I've wanted to try attempting to make is like a really good magic system, but that's really, really hard, of course. Yeah. So that's that's like a huge influence and of and I, I love that show growing up. Another one was um, Puka. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Hence my um, screen name. I just yeah. think it's just so goofy and it puts a lot, you know, draws a lot of, you know, s similar to Rodmo and Half. It's like ridiculous, silly martial arts and kind of calls back to like Hong Kong cinema, which is something I've also always looked up to. But it's also just like really cartoony and goofy and the designs are really fun. I always wish that I could have worked on that show. That's like, mm -hmm. I'm like, darn, I uh, came into the industry too late. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Gosh, There's darn There's nothing it. you can do about that. Yeah. And I think I tweeted about this a couple days ago, but there's this, um, <laughs> this is another weird one. There's this like Hallmark e-card series called Hoops and Yo-Yo that was back in like the 2000s. And it's so goofy, but that's like, I feel like that's where I get a lot of my, like my sense of humor from. And they had like, it evolved from e-cards to like these shorts. And then they made a whole like Halloween special movie and it got like its own lore, but it's just like two guys in front of two mics. And they just kind of, I think they like improv most of it. And it's just mm -hmm. so ridiculous and funny. And I wish that I could have been there to see them just like do their thing. Cause they're just so funny. They're just so ridiculous and goofy. And I I'm like, man, if I could write something as funny as that, you know, one day. <laughs> I think those are those are like three things that I'm always like I think about when I'm making my stuff. It's interesting. Yeah. Okay. You have a you have a nice like smattering of uh influences. Yeah. <laughs> Bionicles. Cool. Bionicles. Hallmark yeah. e cards. <laughs> I like that. I think that's cool. I think it's better. I, I get um 
I, I like when it's not, I'm going to throw shade on so many people probably, but it's like when all the people have is like Disney and Miyazaki, it's like, guys, there's a lot more out there. Like <laughs> There is so much there. Yeah, there is so much. And like, I, I didn't even like scratch the surface of all the things that I like. Keep talking. I want, yeah, let's hear Gosh, it. Gosh. Yeah. Like, I mean, I loved watching What a Cartoon, of course. Um, and seeing the diversity of cartoons that were being pitched and made. I think that's another reason why I was, like, super excited about the Nick Shorts program and how, like, yeah. so many different shorts were coming out. Because I just love having a huge range of awesome stuff to look at, of, like, so many different styles. Like, watching What a Cartoon. And I forget which shows actually got picked up from What a Cartoon. Was it, like... Powerpuff Girls, uh, uh, Dexter's mm. Lab, uh, I forget which one. A lot of them, yeah. Yeah, but there were so many. I just think I, as a kid, I liked like different styles to look at, and I drew from a lot of those things. And of course, like lots of live action stuff, like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. I freaking oh, love okay. that. I don't hear that brought up. Really? Oh, that one's it's so good. It's so like so much Hong Kong cinema. I also like uh, Police Story, <laughs> all those things. Yeah, I, I've seen Police Story. That's great. It's yeah. that's a great one. You know, of course, like classic Jackie Chan. Jackie Chan rules. Jackie Chan freaking rules. And uh, ooh, I think also what really really stuck with me <laughs> was Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> Kung Fu Panda is great. That's a that's like a. Yeah, that's one of my favorite CG movies. It's, it's yeah, fantastic. Yeah, it's great. It's funny. It has great action scenes. I mean, on top of that, it's funny. And yeah. the the designs are wonderful. I think the designs are just wonderful. Uh, like, there's also, like, some really emotional scenes, like, with Master Uguay. Oh, my God. I always cry. Yeah. Yeah, I love Kung Fu Panda. And the second one was beautiful. What a beautiful villain that they made. So wonderful. Have you seen uh, Yip Man? Yes. Yeah, I really like it. That one. Oh, that's great. That one actually breaks my heart to watch because of like all the political stuff that they yeah. put into that. And that breaks my heart to watch. Um, all the sequels, they just kind of went into like, he is very strong and now he's just they fighting. Get, they get worse. and <laughs> Yeah. I know. Once he's like punching Mike Tyson, <laughs> who's like the yeah. worst actor on the planet, that that's when it really starts to take a dive. It's like, Oh, oof. gosh. I... I couldn't believe that happened. And I was like, this series started off so strong. Yeah. <laughs> it's so like, good. it's like, come on, give me a pot. Let me see you hit me. It's like, ah, oh, come on. The first one's awesome. First one's great. And it's obvious they did not mean to make sequels. It's so, no. it's so obvious, but you know. Every time didn't. it ends, it's like, and then he taught Bruce Lee and went on to do all these things. And then you see in the sequel, it's like, they always have to bring Bruce Lee into it somehow. And it just gets like cheaper and cheaper. And it's like, oh man, who cares? In this house, we ignore the sequels. We just yeah. focus on that one. <laughs> that's like, uh, that's like Rocky for me. Oh. Like, I, I oh, love gosh. Rocky to death. And like, they get worse and worse and worse. Like it is bad by the end. Rocky is great that is a good one i i get very emotional watching rocky every time uh, it's like i'm like he did it he went the distance I, he, yeah exactly <laughs> v have you watched any like hong kong cinema as well or not so much i I've, I've only watched a couple of the title that you've said but i i definitely want to watch more i feel like i feel like i i have so much to watch yeah i was just gonna say yeah i haven't really um seen like i've seen just like a couple of the genre but not like a whole lot i guess also because like we weren't like big tv people in my family mm -hmm. like it was i don't know like my dad was really not into us watching any kind of tv oh. whether it would be movie or, or tv so i kind of like learned to read instead mm -hmm. so now okay. I feel like i'm oh, yeah, constantly yeah. playing catch up <laughs> got it <laughs> like, got it all the shows and all the things you know, I was thinking, what if we went on to the questions that um, were asked on Twitter? Oh, yes. Yes. Because we have a couple. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. Mm -hmm. And the first one is, what is some advice you'd give to someone practicing to be a storyboard artist? Okay, Marie, go. Me? Me first? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll just say what I did. Basically... I just watch a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's, that's always my first thing. I'm just like, 
get things that you know are really well shot, well made, and like study that. Especially live action. Even if you want to work in animation, you know, you gotta have you know, you know, have a good balance of both of like yeah, absolutely. animation stuff that you watch and live action stuff that you watch because the way the camera is treated in live action and animation, there is, you know, there can be some variance. I mean, of course there's similarities, but, you know, in live action, it's a very like stable, uh, I mean, unless you're Peter Jackson, um, but it's a very like, you know, realistic camera is being, cause it's physically there, it's shooting there. Um, and so that's always good to, you know, study. Let me think of like really good movies that I would watch. Blade Runner <laughs> mm-hmm. is a great one. That's a good one. And I always call back to Hong Kong cinema because the way they treat the camera is quite different, but it works for action. So if you want to do action stuff, Hong Kong cinema is great. Yeah, so that's my that's my number one tip. What about you guys? Um, yeah, as far as storyboarding, like I, I think that's a really good one. Don't get too locked into your own style or anything. Like I, I see that happening a lot where people. Because you have to learn, you have to be able to adapt to different shows, and it's not mm-hmm. just comedy or action or whatever. That's not all there is to it. Like you have to be able to have a strong enough draftsmanship that you can adapt to different styles. Be able to, you have to know proportions well. Like that's a thing. It's like more than anything, I see that being brought up a lot. As it's like keep characters not necessarily on model. But they have to be the right size in relation to each other and to the environment. And like a lot of younger board artists, I think, screw that up, myself included. Myself included as well. Yeah, that's just the thing. <laughs> it's just something you have to learn. Um, but yeah. it's it's worth learning. I don't know. A lot of the stuff you just kind of pick up on the job. And so it's hard. That is a thing, yeah. I think, I, I think doing your own stuff is really important. That's something that I'll definitely um, say is that like, you you shouldn't just do boards you shouldn't just do board uh tests or you know like you shouldn't just post examples of storyboards like you got to do comics you got to do a lot of stuff like you have to be versatile and like do backgrounds like don't avoid doing backgrounds because you're gonna have to draw them like even if it's just rough layouts you have to understand composition and things so it's like be well-rounded even if all you want to do is is do boards because it'll it'll show through Mm -hmm. like people will will notice uh, v. Yeah, I feel like uh, you guys are like pretty much kind of like nailed it. Like for me, my main number one thing would be to just like sketch a lot, do a lot of life drawing, lots and lots of life drawing. And just because the, the better of a draftsman you're going to be, the easier it's going to be to storyboard. Just because I feel like storyboarding, you're always going to have to adapt to the style of a show that you might not be familiar with. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had to adapt to shows that were extremely cartoony, others that were very realistic, others that were just kind of like in between. And, and it always takes a hot second to get used to the art style. So I feel like if you're really strong draftsman, it, that comes in easier. Mm -hmm. And also just when you have to do notes or like when like a whole sequence of yours gets like cut or you have to reboard, then it's just like not as daunting to think about the drawing aspect of it, you can kind of like focus more on the, on the like filmmaking aspect of it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, really having drawing nailed down as like a tool is hopefully something that uh, like to strive for. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, to just kind of talk a little bit about your New Zealand trip, just cause like. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's interesting and I think and I want to tie it into all this stuff because I think that it's important for people to go out there and travel and like do stuff mm-hmm. and not just sit watching anime and like hoping that they'll somehow get creative ideas or just like life will happen for them because it doesn't and I, mm-hmm. I think it's really cool that you just like went for it <laughs> and went out there <laughs> and had a crazy experience like it seems like it was insane. Um, it does tie into all of this somewhat so I can I can kind of tie that back into but basically yeah. I had, you know, just ended on a really great, I I was on Infinity Train and it was really great, but I had been like going, going, going for maybe like two, three years. And my body, like my doctor was like, dude, you like need, he, this was a breaking point for me was when my doctor said like, you need to think about another career path because your body cannot 
like keep up with what your industry calls for and I was like whoa that's heavy and I was like I can't think of doing anything except animation though and I was like pacing I was like oh what do I want to do and then all of a sudden this opportunity came up where I was like well I have like all this money saved up because I just saved up a bunch of money Mm -hmm. Uh, I've always wanted to go to New Zealand like ever since I was a kid because I have this like fixation on it um, because mm-hmm. of Lord of the Rings, um, just like as a, as a yeah. side note, um, <laughs> and uh, Bionicle, Lord of the Rings, Tokyo Mew, <laughs> and, <Senorio. laughs> and they're shooting the Amazon series for Lord of the Rings in New Zealand, and they're calling for people that are under five foot to be extras. What? Oh, that's so great! I love this. So I'm sitting here this. and I'm thinking. My show just ended. My show is ending in like two weeks. I have all this money saved up. I have this opportunity to go to New Zealand and be an extra on the Lord of the Rings. I'm going to do it. And so I bought. Yes. That's why you went to New Zealand. I didn't know that. <laughs> that is amazing. I love this. So I went on my last two weeks of working, which I finished my boards like two weeks early. Um, so I was just like sitting there like doing nothing. And so I got my New Zealand work visa. It's a temporary work visa. So you can go there. You could stay two years if you wanted to oh, wow. and work how, wherever you want. Um, it's not a residency. It's just a work visa. So you're sure, staying yeah, in like yeah. hostels or like um, homestays or whatever you want to do. And um, I got my work visa. I signed up with the New Zealand talent agency that was hiring for the Lord of the Rings show over there. And yada, yada, yada. Got my New Zealand social security number. Got, <laughs> like, got like my bank account. Got everything. So I was pretty much like a, a offshore wow. um, international, not a citizen, but a work visa holder. And so I bought my ticket the next day and it was a one-way ticket. So it was like, I don't know when I'm coming back. And I ended on my show, I ended on Infinity Train, and then like two days later, I was like, peace, goodbye, USA, I'm leaving. And I left, yeah. I left with uh, one backpack and two shirts, three pairs of pants, two pairs of, of shoes, a couple socks, whatever. And that was it. Oh, by the way, do you, do you like camping? Yeah. Because that sounds like a really, like a great way of packing. I'm like, I'm so happy to hear you say that you packed so little. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a, I, I used to camp all the time as a kid. So, so, and I was like, oh, this is my first time. I'm going to go solo backpacking. And so Mm -hmm. I was like, all right, cool. I'm just going to go solo backpacking in New Zealand. I mean, they speak English there. So that's another thing that I don't need to like have to worry about is language. Um, And so I went I bought a car. <laughs> Wowie. So I was a car owner in New Zealand and I transformed mm-hmm. the car into a camper. So I I went to like the um, equivalent of Home Depot there, which is like miter 10, a uh, meter 10. Uh, and I went and I got like my two by fours, my three quarter plywood, some like uh, wood screws, L hinges, and I made a bed <laughs> and I put that yes. in the back of my car and I stored up my car and then I was off on the road for four months and I drove wherever I wanted to. I went wherever I wanted. I stopped wherever I wanted whenever it was available for camping. I camped out in like the wilderness, like up in the mountains. I was like in like giant fields and in like I saw black sand beaches and it was just so incredible. It was the most amazing thing I ever did. And at the same time, I was working with this talent agency and I would do extra roles all over New Zealand. And that's how I got like more money to, to fund my trip. That's amazing. I love this so much. It, it was so great because I got to decompress, you know, I got to go at my own pace I I worked with my doctors and my physical therapists for like the last couple weeks leading up to the trip so I could really like my body could be really really ready for this kind of trip because I did a lot of hiking. I think I hiked for 8 9 hours a day and I uh it was and I lived off like granola and like yeah. you know and I would like cook at the campsites and I met so many people and it was so amazing and I I was like really refreshed and I had and I just like took a ton of pictures and I just like wrote a lot I did a lot of writing when I was there and it gave me time 
to just like take a step away from the industry, which is great because I found myself being in a like a bubble, just right. staying at home and working within the industry and like for me like that's not you know not a bad thing but at least for me personally like I really needed to take a step back yeah yeah and like reevaluate a lot of things like my goals in life and all that stuff so this was totally. like a soul searching trip that I took for four months <laughs> please make this a Sundance movie please <laughs> I know oh, it was great and it was just like it was so beautiful and just going and being out there and looking like experiencing things that I would have never wanted to do like I went skydiving and I rafted down like a 20 foot waterfall like a free fall and I did like all Jeez. these crazy things that I would have never thought I would have done I feel like at least creatively, that unlocked me to also go outside of my comfort zone creatively as well, because I realized that I could do all these different things, and I'm still okay, like, I'm still alive, you know? Yeah. And I got really trapped within my bubble here, um, working and, like, trying to figure out things on my own, and I think I just needed to let go for a little bit. And also, it's just great to travel um, yeah. if you have, like, the means to, of course, always. And um, it's a huge privilege to be able to travel, so I'm really thankful for that. Sure. Yeah, I man, I, I think that's amazing. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> I, I can't overstate how crazy that is. Like, it's, it, yeah, I don't know. I really admire it, and I think that, like, everyone should do it. And, I mean, I've only gone... I've been to Japan a couple of times. I mean, I've done a little bit mm. of traveling here and there in the past couple of years, mm -hmm. and it, it changed so much of my outlook. And, like, yeah, if you can, and, you know, honestly, like, it's worth it, like, just to put some money away and try to figure it out. Because it's like, like, even you, like, you, you kind of just scraped by, but you did it. But it's like, I'm sure it doesn't sound like you regret it. <laughs> it was very bottom of the barrel, like really scraping by my main my main financial hit was probably the gas for my car because i was driving right. i drove right. all across the country i visited both islands like all the time i was driving everywhere but then um at night you know i would just check into a campsite either free or it would be like five bucks and i would sleep yeah. in the back of my car or if i wanted to be fancier i would check into a 14 dollar hostel <laughs> or honestly though this is like my favorite kind of traveling like i feel I feel like in, I don't know, I don't know if it's like a cultural thing, but for me, like the essence of traveling is like, is, is, is like exactly that. Like you just, you're just backpacking and you're just like living it rough. And that's like how you get to really kind of get in contact with people. Like, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and visit more because you, you're not dependent on like the luxuries of life, so you're more free. And yeah. I think that's just so inspiring and so cool. Yeah, it's just like single backpack, no plans, and it was it all worked out. Like, I'm an anxious person, but I, I just yeah. trusted it to work out, and it and it did. So that was great. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Yeah, it takes a lot. I think that's probably that what holds a lot of people back is just like worrying about everything that could go wrong. But especially in an English speaking country, like it's not going to be that bad. Like you'll figure it out. Yeah, just got to right. take the precautions. You know, I was always safe. Right. Um, I always made sure I told um, someone where I was going that right. day. Right, that's good. And yeah. like I always messaged my, my roommate and I was like, I'm doing this today. I'm staying here. And then, that's smart. you know, and on the bigger hikes, you know, like the nine hour hikes, you always check in with the park ranger and you're like, I'm going to go up here. Right. And they always have to head count you because if you don't come back, then they go search for you. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. 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 yeah, and that was another thing because I have a pretty debilitating physical disability that is really hard for me to get over. And not like I'm trying to get over my disability, that is wrong wording, but like I I love hiking and it was just like at that point I could take my time with the hikes and take as much like rest period in between the hikes. But when I did the hikes, I felt like I, com I accomplished so much. And it kind of made me feel like, oh, if I can do this, like, as long as I take care of myself and, you know, take, you know, try to go at my, at a good pace when I get back to work, like, I know I can continue with my work. Like, I just mm -hmm. need to make sure, like, you know, that's communicated, obviously. But, like, I left, I left animation for that, that four months feeling a little sad, like, like, I'm not good enough. To work in this industry because of my disabilities you know yeah and then i came back thinking 
well, I do have my disabilities, but that doesn't mean I can't do my job. But like, I just, you know, I just hiked Tongariro. Like that was, that's a, that's like a 14 or like a 19 kilometer hike. Yeah. Like I can, as long as I take care of myself and monitor myself, I can still go at my job and I felt a little bit more hopeful, but that's like another like soul searching thing that I realized yeah. on my Nah, trip. dude, that sounds amazing. That's like <laughs> such a, that's such a great story. Like, I think that's, everyone should, especially when you're like in your twenties and you're just kind of bouncing around, like do fucking go for it, man. <laughs> just like do shit, try things. Like artists get so closed off in their career paths and everything, but it's like you you run out of ideas, you run out of passion when you're not when you're just stuck in that bubble, like you were saying. And it's yeah. like even going to Japan for well a total of four weeks now, but I've, I've gone a couple times. It like refreshed me every time I go. I'm like, oh, that's right. That's why I want to do this stuff. Like it like really it sets things right in your head and it gets you out of that routine and everything. Like it's, it's really nice. I feel like it's something, I feel like it's just a habit. It's just like a healthy habit to kind of like uh, build into your own life. And you don't even have to go so far. Like I feel like, especially in California, we're lucky that we have like the Pacific uh, Crest Trail that's like right oh there. Oh my God. Or, like... I wish I could hike that one day. Yeah. One day. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to do it. Yeah. I swear. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Um, and we have so many like beautiful national parks around here too, like Sequoia. And even just like Utah isn't that far. Yeah. And you've got like Moab and like all the arches and the great like desert parks. And yeah, because yeah. you know, like when you when you think about like New Zealand or Japan, it's like, well, plane ticket and like a lot of planning and yeah, like, it's expensive. a lot of time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But like, I feel like even if you just like, Ride your car around the U.S. There's already like a bunch. Yeah, America's of cool huge stuff. And, and yeah. beautiful. Even Yosemite is really nice. Like Yosemite. I've gone to Yosemite a couple times. I haven't been to Yosemite. That's one that I really oh, wow. want to go to. Yeah, I've been to like Bra- like Bryce Zion, Grand Canyon, like all the other ones, except for like Yosemite and Yellowstone. I don't know why I haven't huh. been to those yet. Yeah. Yosemite is a lot of fun. Yeah, my my partner and I have gone there uh, a couple of times. We there was one time we were living in San Francisco, so it was a little bit closer. Mm. But we drove up in the morning, which is not a short drive. It's still like a four hour drive. Yeah, we drove yeah. to Yosemite, drove around for a bit, and then drove back that night. But we were like in our early twenties and didn't give a shit. But that's what I'm saying. It's like you just go for it and you just yeah. have these experiences and like it was fun. Being outside of your of the creative bubble is is good for everything, I feel. <laughs> but what if we brought the discussion back to the creative bubble yeah. with the questions from our <laughs> listeners? <laughs> Yeah, we have a couple more to go yeah, through. Yeah, a couple. But they can be quick. We don't have to like go on a, a long a, a long speak. No, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, what's the funniest thing you guys snuck in the background of a show or what do you leave in the Storyboard Pro margin? I have a good one, but Marie, do you have anything? Oh gosh. I oh god, I draw constantly <laughs> in the margins and like I always I always delete them, you know, so I don't like mess with the file size but sometimes i accidentally leave them in and there's it's just like stupid drawings of like little right. lobby people and i'm just like oh i need cold brew or like mm-hmm. something you know or like a guy like farting i don't even know <laughs> it's just like <laughs> stuff in the background though your director finds it later yeah and they're always like what's this and i'm like i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to leave it in there. Uh, I want to hear what you've done, though, Gene. I feel like I uh, <laughs> when I was on uh, Loud House, I, I worked on Loud House as a background layout artist for yes, four yes. and a half years, uh, <laughs> which was maybe too long. So you have a lot of good background stuff. Not really. I for me, it was mostly. I, I got a lot of the job that I kind of had was sort of a junior background artist, and so I did a lot of just like different angles and just slight changes to things. So mm. I didn't get to like do a lot of um, key backgrounds, I guess. But there was, and yeah, I would try to sneak in things here and there. There was a whole fiasco where I tried to put in a bunch of uh, temporary tattoo designs for, and so it was like, I I put in like references to all these things that I thought nobody would catch. Half of them were caught and then it became just the cascading like, Gene, you can't put all these things in there, but whatever. (laughs) 
Uh, that one wasn't as fun because I didn't really get away with anything. But uh, the the one that is really funny is there was a shot of um, one of the sisters, Luann's room, and there's all these things on her wall. And I put a very subtle reference to loss.jpg in there. Oh, like no. it was like stick figures. Like no. it was basically just the shapes. And I was like, nobody will notice this. And this is just like a thing for me to laugh about. And like the second it came out, everyone was like, I was going to say like, yeah, like I had one of my friends reach out to me on Messenger and asking me like, V, you work on Loud House, right? And I was like, yeah. And they were like, is this loss? And I was like, well, let me talk to Gene. <laughs> <laughs> that was like when that was like when V first started, or at least you, you were in house. That's so funny. And so, yeah. And people thought that it was the creator of the show. And it's like, yeah, he's really involved in every single background and every sing- So it's like, so I didn't Gene. even I didn't even get credit at first. No. And, uh, but then it's like, it came out and I was like, yep, that was me. And like, it's still occasionally it'll come back around and suddenly I'll see like a surge of people like, oh my God, who did this? And then it's all like, it's the creator of Planet Panic at Gene Goldstein. And I get all these messages. I'm like, yep, (laughs) God, the thing I did. Your legacy to the world, Gene, just spreading the meat spreading the memes that's a good one that's a really good one it was uh i it's my one claim to fame fuck everything else i've done i put loss in loud house <laughs> <laughs> no that's really funny though <laughs> what about you v, v what about you uh, let me think i don't feel like I, I i draw a lot in the margins i do draw a lot mostly emo stuff because i'm emo <laughs> <laughs> He is emo. Female. So, like, I, I became emo when I was 14, and then I never turned back. i have uh, emo forever. Great. That's awesome. I did <laughs> I did draw some smut sometime in the margins, and I was V. Oh, but I, I did not forget to take it out. Yep. V. Yep. So, <laughs> Whoops. That's, that's playing with fire. Yeah, geez, that I is know. that is so dangerous. You are so ballsy. <laughs> Like, do not do like anybody listening to this podcast. Please do not follow in my footstep. It's um, yeah, he's a risk taker. I'm a wild card baby. He's a pervert. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> the third question is: Do you guys listen to music and or podcasts while boarding? And if so, what are your faves? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, that ties into the musicals, Mar- Marie, because like um, that was something that someone wanted you to talk about too oh sam wanted me to talk about musicals oh god of course you did that's but i could talk about that all day that's that's bad (laughs) you got you got five minutes go (laughs) um okay well yeah i listened i'm a theater kid uh former theater kid former choir kid and of course that blood never leaves you so i listen to a lot of musical theater and i go i watch a lot of musical theater and that's something i definitely listen to while i'm boarding it makes me emotional and then i put all my emotions into my boards (laughs) there we go (laughs) but uh, hey that's interesting yeah yeah. but i I, like i also listen to like um lo-fi hip-hop beats to study and chill too oh sure (laughs) that one that is actually magic that actually makes me zero in on my boards so hard huh. and i'm like i don't know why well it's neutral music yeah yeah or a mario kart music that's when i'm like deadline hmm. that's when it's like the pitch is coming soon Interesting. you need to um work very hard <laughs> so i put on mario kart music so those three things i do have those playlists as well yes like when it when you get when it's like crunch time and you're like there's no other way around this deadline than to stay up really late, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you just I just crank up the EDM and I'm having a rave. Yes, in my head. V. <laughs> yes. That's just like you're like <laughs> and next like, and then like you pick the tracks that are like the beat is like a little fast, so like you don't even need to like do anything crazy or like your blood just starts like pumping faster. And you're just, like, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> baby. <laughs> it's so true. I I have two. Well, so as far as podcasts, I, I, I listen to a lot of like video essays and stuff. Like I absorbed a lot of mm, yes, yes game design videos just because it was like nice background. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I feel like I'm very well versed in how to make a game, but I will probably never get to make oh, a game. Oh, I'd love to see a game from you. I think it'd be awesome. I would love to see it too. It is very hard. <laughs> I listen to a lot of Mega64 podcasts. That's They've been mm. my, my boys 
for like 10 years now. Like I went through their whole backlog when I first got into it. Oh, wow. And I still keep up with them and they're, they're friends now. So that uh, was kind of a weird uh, turn. If like it, a parasocial friendship became a real friendship. But uh, <laughs> and then I, I kind of like go in and out of music, listening to music while I work because I, I just ran out of music that I like. Mm-hmm, I don't want to mm-hmm. keep doing the same thing. But I did. I discovered Slipknot's live album at one point. Oh, my God. Geez. I already I love I love Slipknot. I don't give a fuck. Everyone can shut up. No, I love that. That's great. Yeah, I love Slipknot. But I I kind of like I listened to them in high school and then I kind of got embarrassed by it. And then I came back to it uh, when I was going through a lot of uh, shit with just like development and everything because I had so much rage in me that I like needed an outlet. I love it. I love it. I support this. Thank you. And so I discovered their live album and I that is now my go-to. That's my go-to. Like if I need to uh, get stuff done, I'll put on that album and it like, I'm like, like I just get so like fired up. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, I'll fin- I, and it's long too. So like I rarely even finish it by the time I've like finished whatever I needed to finish. But that's great. I saw them live oh, this year, I think. Shit. Well, it's been a, it's been a year. And they were not as good as I thought. But that was, that's just... Uh, that's okay, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, they're getting older and it was a huge <laughs> festival. And so I was surrounded by just like the worst, like borderline juggalo people. Oh, <laughs> oh I miss live shows. God, remember that? Yeah. Remember that? Man, man. I miss, I miss playing them too. I was... know. I'm not giving up. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you guys, all my favorite DJs, I'm going to go to see all their shows Heck in 2021. Because yeah. the virus will be Definitely. cured for sure. I believe in this. <laughs> I have no data to prove it, but it will happen. Cool. I think that's it. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about, Marie? What would be cool to talk about? <laughs> well, if you want to just, uh, if you want well, to call there's, just... there's a couple more questions, what? actually. There's a, there's a couple more questions that we haven't gone through. Um, the last question is, how do you find experimenting with art styles, uh, analyzing other art styles, and has it gotten easier over time if you've been experimenting? That is the question that always comes up is art styles. You know, I mean, we're all board artists. It comes with the job, (laughs) being able to draw on all the other art styles that, you know, it's it's gonna happen if you're a board artist. Um, I I remember in high school, I I didn't really have an art style. I just kind of drew like what, like I just kind of copied whatever I liked um and that continued into college I didn't really have a quite have an art style so I just kind of leaned into experimenting with other art styles until I finally settled on one but I think actually someone did tell me a long time ago that they're like oh if you want to be a board artist you're gonna have to like draw another art styles like very quickly and what comes with the job and so I got a lot of tips from a lot of people with like drawing on model I don't know I guess, how do you find experimenting with art styles? It just kind of came organically because I didn't, I was trying to find myself for a while. Now I guess it's part of the job, so it's okay. But uh, yeah, I don't know what to say. What about, what what would you say, Jean? I I, I was wondering if you maybe, um, because Jean and I in the previous uh, episode were talking about copying uh, and like having a sketchbook or just little secret files where we would just analyze other artists mm. uh, yeah. art style and like copy just for the sake of like oh what's this line what does this line feel like or like how does this shape fit yes. with other yeah. shapes and like is it is it like a practice that you do or if you if you do anything like that what is it oh for sure like i definitely have a folder on my like you know the ref folder <laughs> the yeah. the big old ref folder <laughs> that we all have you know just like uh, there was a there was another like twitter meme that went around that was like oh drawing drawing in everyone else's art styles or like other artists art styles and i really liked seeing that too mm-hmm. uh, that's pretty much what i try to do sometimes like oh maybe i'll i'll try drawing my characters in this other art style that i'm super you know not familiar with but It'd be fun to to feel how it is drawing in that other art style that's like a little bit out of my my zone. Yeah, just like saving saving art that I really enjoy looking at and that I really like the style of, definitely. And getting on a new show and having to learn that style if it's if like I gotta draw like super super on model for, you know, 
the job, then I'll take like the model sheets and I'll just like open it up in a Photoshop file and I'll trace them over and over until I can draw them like comfortably without having the model sheet around and then until I can draw them uh, that's how I kind of approach uh, getting getting an art style down. Is just pretty much tracing the model sheets until I am comfortable with it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I think the whole idea of like art styles and everything is overrated, and like it, it's uh, it's something that you care a lot about when you're younger, and then you realize that it doesn't matter, and that like you should have a bunch of tools in your toolbox. The people who have the most rigid styles, like they're a great influence, and that's the people who you put in like your reference folder, but. It seems like a lot of those artists have a really hard time just like maintaining jobs because people think that that's all they can do. And so you kind of box yourself in a little bit. So I don't know if it's a good idea. Like if you want to work in animation, I think it's a better idea to just have some versatility and like not worry so much about like having your style because it's kind of it's inevitable that you're going to have a preference for how you draw. Like that's just you can never get rid of that. It like organically evolves too. Just like it'll it'll happen as you grow as an artist. You know, it's not something most people consciously think about is like art style, you know? At least that's what I think. It just kind of happens. I feel like it depends on the people though. I feel like, uh, I don't know, for my part when I was like uh, still in college, I was like really freaking out over like, oh, what, a, what am I what am I drawing supposed to look like? What like what's a good style or whatever? I think it took a lot of just mindless yeah. doodling <laughs> and a lot of life drawing for me to just be like, this is fine. This is how my hand moves, and this is how my brain kind of guides my hand with all the things that my hi- my eyes have seen right. like throughout my life. So it's more of a like just let it flow on paper kind of thing because uh, your experience. But I guess like there's also sometimes like i mean i like the question of like experimenting with other art styles just because sometimes like i don't know if that happens to you guys but sometimes i get bored with the things that i draw i'm just like this is boring like i don't enjoy like drawing this anymore or like that those lines don't feel Mm -hmm. fun anymore so in those moments i think it's always kind of fun yeah but that doesn't seem that that's not that's almost not a question of like style to me. That's just like like I said, it's like adding tools to your toolbox. Like it's not. I remember really. Ha- it's almost like when you have a a base, you know, like you figure out what you're like, how you draw characters, and that is how you draw every single character. Like that was the thing that it was that I was really obsessed with in high school, and I think a lot of people were. Where it's like you have a a standard way of drawing everything, and it's like that's not a good way of thinking because then it's that gets boring and people get tired of seeing your art and it's better just to have some variety i think and and yeah and try things out like you said like try other people's styles a lot of my honestly a lot of what you could say is my style is me imitating other artists that i like and like failing yeah but then it just kind of come becomes like an organic thing and then you're like well this is what i draw now yeah and then other people take something from yours I, i there was a quote from somebody that it's like uh artist style is really just everything they don't know how to draw it's like uh finding shortcuts of everything you don't know how to draw i forget i forget the exact wording but it's like even um toriyama is i always said that he like hates drawing vehicles Mm -hmm. and that's why he comes up with all those like really squishy fun uh cars and it's like the thing that people love the most about his art is these he loves drawing vehicles and stuff because he was uh he would draw the covers for the models of like tanks and like cars and all that so i don't think he hates to draw them i think he actually really loves drawing them i just like his squishy i like his squishiness that's how (laughs) i like to draw vehicles is when they're all squishy (laughs) yeah you posted that recently yeah yeah that's like i never post any cars i draw but i love drawing cars no they were great you should post one (laughs) you should you should look it up he definitely has said that i think that he he kind of um forced himself to draw more and more uh on on the covers as a way to like get better at it but he's definitely said that like when he was kind of starting out he like hated drawing them so he would just come up with designs for them 
But yeah, you're right. Eventually, the covers for Dragon Ball all have these like really complicated motorcycles and shit. And it's like, oh, I meant like a model, like model building, like you know, like small. Because he was he he loves miniatures uh, mm. or like model building, and that's like one of his favorite pastime. And so he he did do a lot of art for companies that were putting out yeah like models for for mm. a, a lot of different vehicles and like planes and planes. like yeah like war. Right. Uh, I think we went through all of it. Wow. Nice. Good job. Great job, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> That's all applaud. That's all applaud. Uh, congratulations. Uh, congratulations. Congratulations. Amirato. Congratulations. So fun. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming on the show. That was great. You have Aww. a lot of interesting life uh, experiences and things to say. Aw, thanks for having me. This was You're fun. You're welcome. <laughs> Cool, yeah. Uh, plug whatever you want to plug. Everyone watch PBS Kids, please. They mm. have great shows. Donate to St. Jude's Research Cancer Hospital, please. <laughs> Donate blood if you can. That's it. That's all I want to say. <laughs> cool. Uh, learn CPR, so first aid, and AED, please, also. <laughs> These are actually helpful, wholesome plugs. Um, this, is, this is what's really important to me in life, though. <laughs> Um, yeah, get your CPR first aid AED, AED license. It's really easy. They have social distancing classes. Oh, cool. Just do it, please. Just do it, please. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah. Yeah, do that. Listen to Marie. <sighs> I will plug your stuff for you. Look up Puka Noodles. <laughs> Great. Apparently you're doing a comic. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Thank you. You have a podcast as well? Oh, that's right. I do a podcast with me and my roommate, but it's it's we call it our poop cast. We literally <laughs> just do, it's like, it's <laughs> as raw as possible that's like our our aesthetic like we just upload the raw audacity file to... oh my god <laughs> yeah nice so it's the am it's the am poop cast if you want to watch or listen to it it's really whatever but i love it so <laughs> yeah that sounds great uh i am at gene goldstein on social media and i will not pronounce my handle because no one's gonna be able to write it down so uh, <laughs> with all of that <laughs> <laughs> oh, <dang it. laughs> i hate saying my name um so i will just it's just gonna pop all up right. on the screen like it's it's there on it the is. screen <laughs> <laughs> But thank you so much for coming on the show, Marie. Like that was so yeah. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having. Me. It was like a great week. To just like also catch up because like it's been such a long time and the pandemic and like that was so great to hear you like go in New Zealand and and be an extra <laughs> and though as a little hobbit yes. guy. So should we expect you to make an appearance in the Lord of the Rings show? Okay. The thing is, they have like one hundred extras. Oh, like right. I. Like, I don't even know if the parts that they filmed with me in them would even be there. So oh, I'm gosh. just like, I just like that I had that experience. Sure. But you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can see me in other things that are coming out soon, though, because I was in random other shows. I don't even know. Well, I look forward to seeing you in that one New Zealand soap opera that you were in. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sh Shortland Street. <laughs> oh. Dude, they asked me to be a sick person in a hospital, and I was like, I know how to do that. Got it. You wouldn't even, you wouldn't even know. I know. Cool. All right. Thanks. Thanks for listening, everybody. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.